Hey, buddies, Potato Big Whiskey here, and welcome back to the Aztec Overexplained game in Civilization VI. Things have been going exceptionally well for me, and it's time to keep on going. Our major goal this episode is to get as many of our cities settled as possible. We'd also like to clear out any of the barbarians to the southeast, because that is on a new continent, and there are potentially luxuries over here that we'd like to snag for ourselves. So at some point, I'm going to have to figure out a way to send a military over there, and it'll probably involve turning these archers into crossbowmen. As for an, an, an analysis of our current situation, we're actually in an incredible situation. We've managed to hurt one of the strongest players in the game, Korea, by stealing one of our cities and killing several of our early game units. We're on four cities on turn 80, which is really slow. However, our science and culture is really good because we got a classical golden age and that will last for another nine turns. We also have Ancestral Hall. Ancestral Hall is an extremely greedy play. However, when you're playing against the AI, the AI doesn't really know how to punish greed. So you can get away with this a lot more. That's a really important thing that uh, players just might not realize is the AI generally won't punish you. Now we are going to have perhaps a little bit of a loyalty problem over here in Guangzhou. So I may redirect some of my settlers a little bit more north. And I might need to change my government a little bit in terms like towards more of a loyalty direction than the current direction we're on, which is very much so economic uh, powering. Now, we do have access to lumber mills now, and that's really, really important because in the city of Mal Malinelco, we actually don't have a lot of hills and hills are impor important because that's how you get your production. Uh, if you have flatland and no hills, it's probably a good idea to keep some of your lumber mills. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure to use the pinning feature, which by the way, if you use detailed map tags, you can just press uh, shift A, I believe it is, and you can actually place a pin. And then of course you can press shift D to delete a pin, but it, it's handy to be able to put pins down because it, you know, it's, it's an important tip for new players, especially for single player, is that you can't remember everything that you were going to do. So it's important to think about it. Now, in terms of our next technological direction, it would probably be a good idea to pick up universities and banks. Both of these would give me science and gold, which is kind of the direction that I'm going with my empire right now, considering I'm trying to build campuses and commercial hubs. Again, I'm using internal trade routes sent to my capital for now. Later on, I may switch to external, but I want to get early food and production in these cities just to give them a little bit of a kickstart. And again, I'm using my trade routes internally to keep my cities pumping because that basically added another three production to this city, which is currently about 30% of the city's production. So that seems quite good. I am going to want to get a granary in here relatively soon because I'm a little bit stuck for housing but it's not the most important thing for me to get. I don't have the highest quality land to work, so it's not like an emergency that I get it. You could justify it now, but I think I'll be fine for a little while. Let's go ahead and settle another city. And always remember, in a fresh new city, you should try to place the important districts and the important things like monuments and granaries, all that sort of jazz, get that down. All right, brilliant. There's access to military training, and I've also got a huge swarm of enemies coming in. Now, if I remember correctly, we were heading towards exploration. So maintaining four trade routes would be important because this is going to be a significant culture boost. We also have a relatively large swarm of enemy units coming in. I'm going to get rid of that sack of horse archer because the horsemen can probably only attack the city rather than do real damage to any of my units. I'm also sitting on three envoys, uh, which means potentially if there is an un suzerain city state here, I could yoink suzerainty and maybe get some value out of that. In terms of what I would like to get here, my capital is currently building settlers. And so if I were to put one envoy into Valletta, I would pick up an extra plus one production in my capital towards settlers. So that seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do. So I'll go ahead and switch out Charismatic Leader and instead plug in Diplomatic Legacy or Di Diplomatic League. So the first envoy that I sent to each city state counts as two envoys. And then I'm going to go ahead and pop one envoy into Valletta to gain control of it. And then I'm going to pop two more into Valletta to gain suzerainty of it and gain a little bit of error score and potentially get myself a little bit closer to a, a, a normal age. While a dark age here wouldn't be the worst thing ever, uh, getting a normal age would be quite nice because my empire isn't established enough, I think, to weather the loyalty impacts of a dark age. Uh, this builder is ready down here in Aztec El Poco. Now, if you remember, I have really, really good camps. So you see this tile right here? This tile is going to carry this city alongside these really, really important pasture tiles. Uh, something I don't talk about a lot is that when you're in a city with low quality land, and generally speaking, Tundra is fairly low quality land, uh, you want to look for things that feed your city because that's the hardest part of these tiles is that it's very hard to get food. So 
things like pastors are really good. Here's two pastors in a camp. That's like an incredible combination, especially if we move on here and we're pretty close to picking up stirrups, which will give our pasture improvements plus one food, which will mean this city will be very, very well fed. And then there's plenty of hills around, so there won't be a problem with production. One problem I see with the city over here is that it has very low production. I will have one ivory tile to carry me, which I guess helps a lot. But this city is going to struggle in a lot of categories in terms of production for a long time. So like this ivory and this stone is actually going to be pretty important for this city. We're able to grab ourselves another great merchant here. I don't think there's a particularly much better great merchant coming up behind this. Ah, it was the it was actually the trade route capacity one, which is really, really good. Uh, but that's fine. We, we managed to pick up uh, an extra luxury. So we can get an extra copy of a luxury. Uh, it's usually a good idea to look for a continent that you're not able to settle on. And it looks like we can settle on all of the continents here. So I'll just go ahead and send them off to like honey or something. Just grab that extra luxury. Seems totally reasonable to me. Guangzhou is ready to finish its market. I don't know how I was one turn away from that. Ah! A horseman stepped onto the market, onto the commercial hub and blocked me from finishing the market. That makes a lot of sense. So we're starting to finish more builders out of here. In the city of Sampoala, I think it would be nice to get a little bit more food. So I'm going to finish off this farm triangle here and start to fill that out. We got access to our market in Guangzhou and we are having a little bit of trouble with some of these barbs, but that's okay. These guys coming and attacking our cities is probably a good thing because it means that this land is now open for exploration. Guangzhou has its campus and its commercial hub. It's at its growth limit, so a granary could be considered here. I could look into maybe picking up another district if I wished. Uh, I could probably get a diplomatic quarter here. It's about the time in the game. I would say around turn like 80 to 120 is usually about a good time to start thinking about your diplomatic quarter. Uh, just like that, that's not like based on any hard you know facts or anything. That's just like a, how, how it feels to me. Um, I could also pick up a military unit here if I wished. I think for me, it would probably be between... So I have three major choices. Do I want to keep the city growing? by building a granary, or do I want to build a military unit or some sort of other utility unit? I could also theoretically get the city to produce settlers alongside my capital so that my empire can expand faster. Um, I think the problem I'm running into here is that Aztec warriors, by, by the way, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little bit distracted here. I think I'm probably going to upgrade a couple of Aztec warriors at the man at arms here. I think that's what they upgraded to. But something important about Aztec warriors is actually they stay pretty relevant for quite a long time. You can see here, because of my plus five bonus uh, per luxury attack bonus, they um, they have 33 combat strength, which is kind of comparable to a swordsman. So up until Man at Arms come out, I would say Aztec warriors, as long as you're getting improved luxuries, they're pretty equivalent to having swordsmen eventually, especially with the plus bonus luxury attack thing. They're not quite the same, but since you get them so early and they can level up, they can kind of hold their own against swordsmen. I don't think I'm particularly enamored by getting a district in here right now. I would maybe want to place one. And if I was going to place one, well, here's the thing. If I'm placing one, it's probably the diplomatic order. And then I want to build that as soon as possible. So I think, I think what I will do is I will use some of these eagle, I, I'll, I'll upgrade one of these eagle warriors to a man at arms and send it out into the fog of war. And then I'll use gold to purchase a granary in here so the city can continue to grow. And then I'll go ahead and get to work on some settlers so I can send them to the southeast. And then this kind of party of units should be able to expand my empire effectively. So you can see here I'm getting six charge builders every three to five turns. It'll go up slowly in price. You can see my builders now cost 76, 74 production. So they will get more expensive as time goes on. But this is the phase of the game where you definitely want to get your tiles improved. And it's also really important that you prioritize upgrading things that you're already working. I'm already working this farm, so putting two more farms next to it gives it more food. And um, this is sort of the way that you should kind of think about things a little bit. So let's pop a city down right here. Perfect. Uh, I want to avoid the larger lakes, like I said. I'm okay with settling next to a small lake, but generally I want to avoid the large ones. Now, I didn't actually plan any districts in this city, which is a little bit unfortunate. I definitely want to get a monument and I would like to maybe place a district. I think I might wait until the monument is finished, though, before I place a district, because I need to think about where I actually want to go. There is potentially an okay campus over here. But then I can't find a really, really good commercial hub. I'm just like a little bit at, of, of, of at a loss here. I mean, honestly, this is technically of equivalent value. And maybe I put another district nearby to make this even more worth it. See, my problem is I don't want to put a commercial hub on this mine because this is like Guangzhou's only productive tile really at the moment is this and this. So I think I will just plan a campus for now and let the city slowly build a monument while I think about what I want to do with it. The unfortunate thing happened and we are in a dark age. Now, it's not impossible for me to deal with this, but there is quite a bit of negative loyalty pressure in, in my cities right now. So I have to basically decide what I'm going to sacrifice. The big problem too is that 
wow, Korea didn't get a golden age and my loyalty is this negative. Yikes. That's a rough situation to be in. I'm going to have to come in here and make some changes to my government. I don't think I can switch out colonization and serfdom, but I can put in Limitaniae. That'll give me plus two loyalty in every city that I have a garrison in. And maybe if I can make it to recorded history, plus two loyalty per turn will be helpful. But that little bit of loyalty is going to come in handy. The problem is I have to get a unit over here, but I could always buy a unit. I have plenty of gold. And I think I could also just buy the monument in here to get another plus one loyalty. And then if I go ahead and buy a unit, like, for example, an archer, now I've got an extra little bit of loyalty. So now we're only losing 3.1, which is a little bit more acceptable. We are losing 3.3 here, which is a little bit troubling. But my hope is that growth and production and all those sorts of things will work together to get me what I want. I'm, I'm only upgrading one man at arms, so I'm going to do that without the gold boost. Um, and I need to hold off for a couple of turns before I fill out this city. Yeah, that, that negative loyalty is a lot worse than I thought it would be. Hopefully by like improving this camp with a really strong growth tile, I'll be able to make the city uh, grow and produce faster. Dark age wise, this is probably a good time to do free inquiry because I do plan to build libraries and universities this era. And that's actually going to be a priority for me now. I'm continuing to use my scouting units because there's probably a few uh, tribal villages just sprinkled out of the fog of war. And we want to take advantage of that if we can. Uh, so in terms of so sovereignty and stuff like this, we don't, we didn't found a religion and we're not trading with city-states, so we don't really care about either of these, but we would like to optimally get a hold of the extra points from like the diplomatic victory points. So usually you want to pick one of the city-states that there's a majority of, so like militaristic or religious right here are good options based on what I can see. And then well, another thing to do is to kind of scan around and see if you see any roads leading to city-states, because that implies that somebody is trading with them and like... If you really want to treat with this, you can just like Google or uh, not Google. I said Google. You can like map search roads and then like look around and see, oh, well, you know, nobody's trading with these city states. Nobody. I can't tell if anyone's trading here. I can't tell if anyone's trading here. It looks like someone might be trading with a cultural city state. Can't tell. Uh, nobody's trading with Lahore. Nobody's trading with Leventa. So currently, Valletta and... Ma, well, sorry, Valletta and, oh god, who is the other one? Kumasi are my best targets here. So I'm going to go ahead and gamble on the cultural city-state side of things and put up three votes on that. And then in terms of religion, what you just want to do is like look at all the religions. You look who has the most air, the most diplomatic favor, like Babylon, and you say, okay, does Babylon have a religion? Babylon has the religion of Hinduism. So you come in here and you vote for Hinduism. Boom, boom. And then you save the rest of your points. Bada bing, bada boom. Two diplomatic victory points secured. I don't know if it's a 100% certainty, but it was a pretty good guess, right? So this isn't like a 100% this will work every single time that you do this. I usually ignore this in my games, but it is possible to do this. Most AIs don't actually invest heavily into these. So if you put like three votes in, it's relatively cheap in terms of your diplomatic favor to get an outcome. So now that the Diplomatic Congress, the World Congress is happening, it's probably about time we got our Diplomatic Order. That's usually, you want to hit it before or around the first Diplomatic Congress. And uh, we also have access to education here, giving me plus four science on my universities and the University of Science Corps. I don't think, like honestly, wonders aren't that important. Wonders are more fun. There's a few game-changing wonders, but honestly, you can win 99.9% .9 of your save games without ever even building a single wonder on deity. Uh, let's go ahead and pop down the city here. And I need to think about how I'm going to develop this city. Well, I know that this tile is going to get chopped. So what I will do here is I will place the campus, delete that, get to work on a monument, and then move this builder here to chop this, because I may as well, to get the, just the chop to give the city a little bit of a boost in production, because this tile is going to get crushed anyway. Then we come into our tech tree. And I think I would like to pick up feudalism, because I have a few pastures throughout my empire, and a little bit of extra food would go a long way for me here. I'm continuing to trade internally. Basically, I want to put one internal trade route in every single one of my cities. And eventually, I would like to really, really have the... Um, oh my goodness, where is the card? There is a card here that gives you four gold for every trade route uh, to your own cities. Here it is, mercantilism. Triangular trade is a great way to generate gold with internal trade. I need to continue to find land to expand into. So I'm going to send my eagle warriors on scouting missions over here on the left side of my empire. There is also potentially... A little bit of land down here that I can make use of. And also diplomatic favor 
is something you can just straight up sell to the AI if you don't have a good use for it. Like they will pay like pretty good prices here. And the, the World Congress just happened. I'm not going for a Diplo victory. So I could just sell this off to the AI for 13 gold per turn. And nobody wants to buy my ivory. That's fine. Not a big deal. Montezuma captured Guanju. We must resist this aggression. God, military emergencies are so silly. They appear at the most random last times. And it went through. Who even voted for this? Literally the entire world. So this is like... This is just like incredibly unfortunate timing. I saw I just sold off all of my diplomatic favor and like all of this just went through. I like none of these people have a reason to go to war with me like at all. So this is just again really really unfortunate timing. No none of these players are even in range to do anything to me, right? Like Babylon is here. Like I have to scroll so far to my cities. The only person that benefits from this war is Korea. So I'm going to win this emergency for no point and it basically just makes my empire like more annoying to deal with. The good news is I am well situated for a defense. Thankfully, I managed to get myself a man at arms. Uh, let's go ahead and steal the honey here. And I'm probably going to go ahead and switch to ancient walls just to be able to have an extra city shot here. Should any Korean stuff. So like nothing strong comes out of the fog of war and like tags my city for a million damage. Let's harvest here to finish the monument in one turn. And then we'll quickly grab the watermill because that's plus one food, plus one production, which is kind of like working an extra unimproved mine. Um, and more importantly, there's also a maze in this city. So it's like two food, two, uh, one production, which is again, like working another tile. And so I think for a little bit of a sacrifice of early production and food, this is like a good outcome. Like again, that the watermill is a building you could probably ignore entirely in your game. Like it would be, you would have almost an exact same Civilization Six experience if you ignored it. But it's not, it's, you don't have to ignore it. You can ignore it, but you know, you can use it if you want. Now, my question is here, can I go to, can I, can I get more value out of fighting Korea again? And I think I would be better served by defending this military emergency than trying to be aggressive. I don't want to capture her capital. Uh, I don't want to go for a domination victory as it stands. So I think I'm relatively happy to stand where I am. I do think, though, that I'm going to want crossbow tech. So I'm going to go ahead and start moving towards machinery that's going to be necessary to defend myself. The good news is these archers are fairly good at DPSing because they're quite leveled. They're not perfectly leveled. They're just a little bit leveled, uh, but they should level up in this war again. Looks like I can pick up another great merchant. I will. And then the next great merchant is a trade route capacity one. So I just got another trade route capacity merchant. And I think I'm going to go ahead and put this one in my cow. I'm going to put this one in Mal Malinalco. Nice. There's drama and poetry, which is one step closer to recorded history. One thing I've noticed about my game is I have very bad scouting information on the northern half of the map. So it would be nice to maybe crack out a couple of scouts here to send them northwest before I unlock upgraded scouts. Uh, because they're relatively cheap right now. Um, in terms of my gold, we want to focus fire on these guys as much as possible. When it like, yes, it's I'm not doing much damage with these, but the amount of damage I do will go up uh, pretty quickly here. Also, I think this triggers me to place the encampment. So I'll put an encampment here um, as this will protect the city pretty effectively. This encampment basically turns this into a one tile choke. They have to fight through an encampment, which while not a perfect defense, will slow them down. You could argue that the encampment would be better placed here because that would force them to come out into the choke under threat of my city to actually kill it. But this, you know, it's the AI. Against the player, you might want to modify your placements a little bit. Uh, so looking at the city of Azteca Palazzo, we can probably get to work on a commercial hub and increase that gold income even more. Uh, let's go ahead and use Zhang Qian who will give me plus one trade route capacity so I can keep pumping out traders. So uh, yeah, right now my empire is currently preoccupied with building traders, builders, and settlers. All three of those are the key ingredients to making an empire that explodes out of the gate. One thing you're going to run into a lot in your game is like, damn, I have a promotion, but would I rather shoot? And it really just comes down to, will shooting here change the outcome of the battle? Probably not, but being able to shoot next turn with a plus seven combat strength bonus, that might actually change things. So I'm going to go ahead and take Arrow Storm here. It's often a trade-off you have to do between shooting and uh, upgrading a unit. So we just continue to shoot whatever is nearby, you know, and we try to prevent any shenanigans, make sure we're doing damage to things. Don't let your builders get snatched by chariots and stuff like that. You know, just, just the general, just keep, keep be wise, just keep an eye and like look out for what ways your units might potentially move and cause you problems. So one tip that I would recommend is uh, you can chop out your builders, which is kind of a way to accelerate your build. Uh, it's a tip that I would use and always recommend. One thing about hills. So theoretically, if I were to put a lumber mill on here, I would have a tile with, you know, a, a two food, four production. But here's the thing. I can also chop that and then I could use two builder charges to get 65 production now and then a, a two, three tile. So I could get 65 production now, spend two build charges 
and have one less production on the tile. So like, I'm basically, I'm trading some long-term production for a little bit of a boost now. It can be good for tempo to do this. And I would say generally, this is like a totally reasonable thing to do. But if you just opt to put a lumber mill here, that's like a totally valid choice as well. Like you can make that choice. I would argue that chopping is like ever so slightly more optimal. Like ever so slightly, because for 65 turns, I'm essentially going to be ahead here if I chop. And, and tempo is really, really important. Like when things happen matters. So I think I think it is time now that I build three of my campuses. My science is beginning to fall behind a little bit. So I'm going to derail from settling and get my campuses and libraries up. And the same is going to be said for builders. A whole, three campuses are going up right now across three different cities. Six turns, eight turns and 11 turns. And that's part of the goal here. And I'm even going to get this one a little bit faster because I'm going to do a little bit of chopping in here. I can't quite do any chopping over here, but I am sending builders and settlers in that kind of direction-ish to make some changes there. In terms of range unit promotions, I would say all three of these are equally valid choices in the early game. Garrison is quite nice on the defense and offense because the unit just has to be standing on a district to get plus 10 combat strength. And that's defensive and offensive combat strength. So being able to get garrison and stand on a district actually gives your unit a lot of combat power. So archers are very, very effective at defending cities if you can get them promoted a couple of times. Particularly with garrison, which gives them plus 10 combat strength. And plus 10 combat strength is huge. Like, it's it's an insane amount. So now we have access to recorded history. And in order to uh, provide a little bit of extra loyalty for Teo Tihuan, I'm actually going to come in here to Victor and take the garrison promotion. For two reasons, it'll give me plus five combat strength to all units defending the city, and it'll also give cities within nine tiles plus four loyalty, which means I should be effectively loyalty defended from any Dark Age consequences here. Let's go ahead and start shooting this trebuchet. Trebuchet is now dead. Bish bash bosh. We're very happy. And the city now has walls, which will make it so that it'll be a little bit harder to one-shot it. Players can probably work around it, but it should be fine now. Let's go ahead and make our way towards exploration. So here's a really, really important thing about these trade routes. So like a city like Texcoco, which is going to struggle for a while because it has basically no production on any of its tiles uh, without investment. Like if I wanted production here, I would have to buy this stone and then improve it, which is just not really super viable. This trade route is going to save the city because if I send this trade route to Tenochtitlan, boom, now it's a 13 turn monument. So these internal trade routes are like incredibly important for giving your brand new weak cities tempo. They give them so much tempo. Uh, it's actually unreal. It's hard to even really appreciate it uh, fully until you see an example like that. I generally don't recommend improving plantations on bananas, but they're like a totally reasonable tile, right? It's a four food, one production, two gold tile. In a city like this that already has a ton of food, it's maybe not necessary, but it will allow the city to grow and work more tiles and more population is more production. So it's a totally reasonable thing to do. I am ready to place a district in here, which is a bit problematic because I'm not ready to place a district in here. So I'll take a couple of turns to get a trader and then I'll chop that trader out with this forest chop here that I intend to buy. And then I'll place the campus. Harvested a little bit of stone in my capital that was on this farm tile, which means that I'm getting my campus in two turns. And remember, I want to build those campus buildings because they give science as a base yield. Sempuala, uh, do you want more food? I think theoretically you could use more food or do I want that in my capital? I think you're actually fine for food. You're working three high food tiles and you're nowhere near your growth limit, so you'll be fine for a while. Do you have your granary? You do have your granary, so Sempawala will be fine for a while. I think I'm going to get the diplomatic quarter here. Although, mm, this is an optimization that I need to talk about, actually. Uh, I want to get my diplomatic quarter in the city that I plan to build my late game spaceport. So that's something to consider. So where would I put my spaceport in this empire? If I were to go for one, it's probably going to be in my capital. So I want my diplo quarter to be here, which is a bit problematic because my capital needs to get to 10 population to place its next district. However, I do have a really strong capital and I can make sure to emphasize working high food tiles, which should allow me to get there. Uh, so I'm going to take a few minutes here to get my capital up in population. And I'll probably get a granary and water mill as well to further push the growth up. It'll kind of depend on what the city does, though. This is like a really annoying situation to be in. Like I should theoretically be able to walk through this great general, but for some reason the game won't let me. Uh, so we are now starting to deal with knights and knights can one shot your archers. So you're going to want to position your units very carefully to prevent that from happening by like swapping with man and arms, anything that's necessary to keep your units alive. Let's go ahead and take the garrison promotion on here. And we're one turn away from getting crossbowmen, which shouldn't get one shot by these guys. I can actually even attack with my man at arms because of my extremely high attack bonus. Let's pop down this farm. And this is a good example of showing you the farm triangle in action. Remember, these two farms are producing one food surplus. So between these two farms, it would cost me two population and I would get 
two food surplus. So basically, these two population could sustain uh, three population. If I place this next farm, okay, now three population, okay, it would cost me three pops to work here, but I would get 12 food. 12 food can sustain uh, six people. So I increased my investment here by in, in terms of builder charges by like uh, 50%. Okay, so I spend 50% more and I'm getting twice as much. Does that make sense? I'm getting twice as much value here. So I went from being able, like, just again, to put that in perspective, two farms side by side without feudalism, they can sustain three population. Three farms side by side with feudalism, they can sustain six population. It really is like, Twice as good. These farms are now twice as good with that with that placement. Just just to really put that in perspective for you. I need to get rid of this Korean man at arms. And so it's going to take a few shots here. Unfortunately, I was hoping to like upgrade a couple of these guys. But at the very least, ah, never mind. Uh, let's go ahead and start. Well, I'm two turns from picking up mercenaries. And mercenaries is an important technology because it gives you access to the professional army card, which makes a gold up upgrade discount on uh, gives you a 50 percent makes it cheaper it's, it's half price to upgrade your units and so that would be a pretty efficient use of my gold so i think i'm going to go ahead and do that it's also been 10 turns since the start of the war uh no it's only been nine turns sorry yeah I, I thought i would be able to declare peace i might be able to get peace next turn so we have education we have stirrups um probably the next thing that we would want to get is banking unfortunately we don't have guilds yet so that's not going to get boosted but picking up extra gold here would be pretty good um, our gold economy is relatively strong as it stands. And we did just complete campuses in some of our cities. So I'm going to continue to pump libraries. My question is, do I stop off our granary and watermill first to try and get the city to 10 population? And I think I think I need that food so much that I'm going to go for granary and uh, watermill here just because I need the city to get to max pop. Now, I could also go for Kilwa Kisawani. Kilwa Kisawani is a really, really powerful wonder. I, I said generally wonders aren't important. But there are wonders out there that are so good that they're worth going for. Kilwa is definitely one of them. And now that I'm starting to build up my infrastructure, I also have to start thinking about city-states. And the reason I bring that up is because Kilwa is exceptionally good because it gives you extra yields from being friends with city-states. The problem is that I want to be building settlers. So I'm just kind of being pulled in multiple directions and trying to like very, very carefully make my way through that like little bit of a landmine is, is, is a tough task. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a library in the city. Remember, libraries are worth error score for me on top of their normal yield. So I just chopped out this new trader in Teotihuacan, like I said, and we're going to go ahead and put that in Teo because the city does not yet have a trade route and so it could make use of it. That's kind of how I like to do things. I'll, I'll kind of just like try to get trade routes up everywhere. And occasionally I will go campus first in some of these cities, but I will come back eventually for a commercial hub. I'm going to spend a little bit of my gold in the city of Texcoco because I want to get access to some of these high production tiles. Now, I mean, a two production tile isn't a very high production tile in the grand scheme of things, but in a city where like the highest production tile is... Two, that's a high production tile. <laughs> that's just the way you got to think about it is it, sometimes you have to kind of make the best of the worst world. You have to make do with what's available to you, not the ideal situation that you want to be in. So Sempoala is working almost all of its improved tiles. The only thing that I would maybe add to this city is maybe another mine because it's working an unimproved stone resource right now. And that's how you kind of have to start thinking about things a little bit as well. Uh, there's no point just slapping down tile improvements. Generally, you want to be looking for cities that um, are going to get value out of a tile improvement. Like, okay, does this city need another mine? Like, is it working an unimproved tile? Is it growing? Uh, I'm going to need another tile. Uh, these are things you should start thinking about. Like, don't just blindly improve your territory. Kind of like think a little bit logically. Like, which tile do I actually want to work? And you'll you'll definitely upgrade your gameplay. I'm going to go ahead and take out Limitanii and plug in Professional Army. I could probably make an argument for taking out Colonization just for the temporary, like, meantime and plug in Urban Planning because that's eight production. It's only one production per city, but in a lot of these low-quality, newly settled cities, that's actually a significant amount. I am sitting on two envoys. And I have suzerainty of both militaristic city-states. I think I'm going to take suzerainty of Leventa just for the era score, honestly. So for two envoys, I get some era score. That seems like a totally reasonable thing to do. And it'll also give me vision as well as control of this territory. And I can always levy their units. Let's go ahead and continue to send trade routes to Tenochtitlan. Like so. I'm trying to think about where exactly I want to settle my city here. Generally speaking, when you're settling a city, you want to look for fresh water primarily. I've talked about this a little bit. But like when you're settling city, second cities, you want to look for a good tile to settle on a good first like two to three tiles to work and then like good placements for your district so if you can hit all three of those you're in good shape like if i were to look at this city i see okay i've got like tobacco that's a pretty good tile to work it's two food two production one faith i've got horses here that's a pretty good tile to worth 
Uh, it's like, you know, four food, two production. And then I got an iron mine here. You know, these are three tiles that I can justify working pretty easily. Um, there's potentially a few different tiles I can place things. So I would want to place a city somewhere near all three of these tiles. Like I wouldn't want to place here because it's a little bit far away from my empire. The other really, really important thing to consider when placing your cities is that like, if you think about it, in a typical game of, game of Civ, your city probably isn't going to make more than like 15 population in total. And that's like a really, really strong city. And if you count the number of tiles that's around a city, like the first ring is six, and then the second ring is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There's twelve tiles. So six plus twelve is eighteen. So there's eighteen viable tiles around your city in terms of like population. So you don't have to space your cities out perfectly to where there's zero overlap between them. You can have a lot of overlap between your cities um, and it's not a big deal, particularly because, you know, you you probably aren't, realistically, most cities won't get more than like 10 to 13 population. So they only need 10 to 13 tiles to actually work. Anything more than that is just like a little bit excessive. So with the 50% discount on crossbowmen, I can spend 125 gold to get all of these crossbowmen upgraded. And by upgrading two crossbowmen, uh, what that does for me is many things. First of all, it actually upgraded my city combat strength here to 40. You can see here, uh, crossbowmen have 40 combat strength. And by upgrading it, it means when I attack now with my city, it will attack like it's a crossbowman with no upgrades, which is a pretty good deal. And the same is true for military, uh, for melee units. The combat strength of your city is dependent upon the strongest melee unit you have, minus 10. So the base combat strength of my cities are, is, is 35. What was the other thing I was going to say? I've forgotten what the other thing I was going to say is. It was to do with military and stuff like that. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, getting two crossbowmen is actually a boost for metal casting. So, like, doing these sort of things with units and stuff like that is quite efficient because it potentially leads to other boosts down the road. So you want to be looking for places in the tech tree where, where things make sense. Like, oh, building an armory. So getting, like, one encampment is, like, quite good. Building an aqueduct. Getting, like, an aqueduct is quite good. You know, you want to look for these things if you can. Like, kill a unit with a knight. Getting a chariot maybe early and upgrading it into a knight would be good. You know, looking for these areas where you can maybe push a pinch point quite easily without much effort, those are, those are important to do. And that's how you kind of advance as a player. I do need to think about building an aqueduct. I don't have perfect land for it, but I'm thinking of doing it in this city because there is potentially an industrial zone right here that hits a fair few cities. I mean, this hits four cities. That seems pretty good. What we can do is if you use the uh, more lenses mod, you can check out city overlap. And you can see here, different tiles have different numbers of overlaps. Uh, There's a really simple way to read this is um, dark red means, uh, how do, so what do I need to explain here? I need to explain industrial zones. So industrial zones are production-based districts that have a unique set of buildings in them. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about industrial zones. They have a unique set of bonuses from certain tiles. They get bonuses from quarries, from districts, from government plaza, from mines, from lumber mills, from aqueducts, baths, canals, dams, and strategic resources. So they benefit from a lot of things. They give you production. Um, but their buildings are quite unique. So for example, we have the workshop. This is just a basic building. It gives you three production and a citizen engineer point uh, and a citizen slot and a great engineer point. Sorry, is what I should have said. Uh, the, the important building that comes after that is the factory. And the factory is an AOE building. AOE stands for area of effect. That means this building applies all of its yields to all cities within range of the industrial zone. So its production bonus is extended to all city centers within six tiles that do not already have a bonus from this building type. So if I were to put, if I, if I go to this lenses mod, you can see here, a factory will give me three production and then another three when it's powered on. So a, a six production. So it will give me three production for every city within six tiles of the industrial zone. Well, let's say I were to put an industrial zone here. I, I then check the corresponding color. So this is plus six, which means six cities are in range of this tile. So I think I'm going to put my industrial zone there. And this is just, this is just an, the importance of using like tools to your advantage. So now this industrial zone will give me plus three production in every city that's within six tiles of here. And I think that's basically this city, this city, this city, this city, this city, this city. And so that is uh, plus three production is... Uh, times times six is this 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 building now is worth 18 production when i unlock it this factory right that's worth 18 production and then it goes up to 36 when i eventually power the building later on with like a coal power plant or an oil power plant or a nuclear power plant whatever way i decide to power the building it, it's potentially worth 36 production like i want you to go through the tech tree and look for a building 
that has 18 or 36 written on them. You will not find one. These are some of the best returns on investment in the entire game, but you only need like a few of them. You don't need a lot of them. You need like one or two, maybe three of them in your entire empire. You can go for more depending on the save that you're playing. Like for example, Gaul can get a lot of them. Germany can get a lot of them. There's a few different saves that can justify going for more industrial zones. All right, let's go ahead and pop down a mine and let's come into Sempoala. Let's we finished the library in here. We do want to think about our third district. Uh, the interesting thing about the Diplo Quarter is I could build it now in the city in four turns and get advantage of it. But I think I want to build it in Tenochtitlan for a very specific reason. So I'm going to hold off on it. So I will be delaying my Diplo Quarter this game, which is a little bit unfortunate. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and get a university as well. University is a relatively expensive building, but it does have a science yield. And I'm trying to get my science up because remember last era, we were getting our science from our commercial hubs. That's no longer helping us. So we need to get our science up now. We have to kind of like make it happen. Um, in terms of great, uh, in terms of guys here, it could be worth it for me to pick up Magnus a little bit. I could put him into the capital or something like that. Um, Amani is totally reasonable here. I could also promote one of my other guys. Like, for example, Liang is quite good. I could theoretically, one thing I like to do is sometimes go down the Reina line here. I'm making a lot of money this game. So being able to purchase districts with gold could be quite valuable. And I think that's what I'm going to do with this game. And I'm going to head in the gold purchasing direction. Um, what I like to do with Reina, find a city. I just park her there nice and safely. Typically, it'll be a city with a commercial hub. So, for example... Manila, Ma Ma Malinalco is a good spot for her to go. I can grab another great merchant. Korea, Korea is making great merchant points, but nowhere near the rate I am. I'm making like 10 per turn. So I'm just like snatching up all of the great people, which is giving me a ton of um, faith. So you can see here, Ibn Fadlan will give me plus one trade route capacity and also increase my, tr my, um, uh, my trade routes to city-states will also give me faith, which is quite helpful if I ever choose to trade with city-states, which, you know, potentially after this first wave of traders is done, I may look to trade externally. I would say that generally er early game, internal trade routes are better than external trade routes. And then late game, external trade routes are better than internal trade routes. Um, so it looks like they're not willing to take peace with me until this military emergency is finished. Um, so I'm going to have to just play defensive. And it's relatively easy to play defensively if you played aggressively early in the early game. Just like, like three archers honestly can hold an empire, like for the entire game against the AI, as long as you know how to use them efficiently. If you're a relatively new player, play a little bit more conservative, build more units, make more, you know, uh, don't play the risky way that I do. So I think I would like access to this ivory tile. So I'm going to go ahead and buy it and I want to improve it because I want to be looking now uh, for ways to use my gold to accelerate my empire. Um, because I, I've stalled a little bit. I'm not building as many cities as I should be building. Um, I'm stalled because I had to stop off and pick up these campuses. But there is another expansion phase coming in the near future. So from my capital, it'll probably happen after I get my, um, my campus fully built and then maybe even my Diplo Quarter. Let's pop down the camp here. That's a really nice tile, two food, four production. I guess Teo could probably use that tile, so I'll make sure Teo has it. Let's go ahead and settle this city right here on the rainforest. I'm going to go ahead and improve the pasture first. Because it's a four food, two production tile. I'll make sure to lock that tile in because that's going to allow the city to grow exceptionally fast. We'll work on a monument. I haven't quite decided what I want to do with the city in terms of districts. So I don't have to place my districts immediately, but I definitely want to be thinking about, okay, where am I actually putting my districts? Because that's going to decide which tiles I buy, how I try to expand the city, all that sort of jazz. Campus fi finished in Malinalco. We're getting our science up. And we're continuing to get our science up. Because remember, these science buildings are worth era score and science. So like, they're like a double whammy. We managed to complete our encampment in Guangzhou, which is really, really good. Um, although there is a point here to be made to get the aqueduct. Um, how long is left on this World Congress? Yeah, unfortunately, I kind of need to make the um, campus stop happen now. So we're looking at the city of Texcoco. Uh, a granary here would be nice to allow the city to continue to grow. So that's what I'm going to work on. Although, having said that, does the city even really have a tile that's worth growing to, to accelerate it? Probably not. I think it's totally safe to go ahead and build a commercial hub in here. I would like to build one aqueduct, purely for the science boost here, because it's worth like 390. Uh, like, what's 40% of that? It's worth a lot of science, actually, to build an aqueduct right now. And I want, yeah, so I'll probably go like library aqueduct in Malinalco. Otherwise, right now, I would need to get my science up. So it's university time. Get those universities rolling. Our empire is relatively well improved. I'm going to go ahead and harvest here to get that done a turn sooner so I can get a library. Oh wait, it's not the next, it's not the next session that I have to worry about. It's the next era. So yeah, we're actually fine to continue to build science buildings. I think, I think building science buildings will get me the era score I need. 
in a lot of cases here. So that's what I'm going to focus on. So I talked about getting scouts. I've met the Cree. It's nice to meet you. I do need to think about getting more scouts. I'm kind of scouting with military units right now, which is not ideal because these could be defensive units in case I get attacked again. So you can see this is kind of like the land quality you want to see. You want to see like a one, one or two strong growth tiles and then a bunch, a bunch of really good production tiles. That's like the perfect position for a city to be in, in my opinion. And we also want to be looking out for when cities hit growth multipliers of one uh, or, or three times n plus one. So one, four, seven, ten, thirteen, sixteen. Any any multiple of three plus one is an important milestone for a city because it means we can place another district and, like we said earlier, lock in its price. Because remember, this campus is now 190 production. So things are getting a little bit expensive. Um, so we want to get these placed down if we can. I'm trying to think about where I need more builder charges. Um... I actually don't need that many builder charges, which is telling me that my tempo is kind of on point, that we're in a relatively good place when it comes to tempo. Nice. There's the library in uh, Tanakh Titlan. We're going to go get to work on the university. Our science is starting to climb. While we're not top science, we're not far enough behind to be worried yet. Like if we check top science, he has 97 per turn and research 30 techs. We're eight techs behind the top leader, and uh, we should be able to extend that pretty quickly now that we're like focusing on science production. Sometimes it is worth it in tiles like this to go ahead and harvest the rainforest for 35 production. Uh, it scales with the game. But in this particular case, I'm going to go ahead and just improve it because I want the I want the growth tile. Sometimes, though, I will harvest those tiles. It, it's kind of a personal preference thing. It depends on if you want tempo now or tempo later. It just depends on your, your personal preference, like I said. Uh, we can obliterate these knights now that we have crossbowmen, which is honestly an amazing place to be. Something feels very nice, in my opinion when you're able to do this. We completed the market in here. Do I want to, or we completed the commercial hub. Do I want to go for the market right now? Yeah, I think I do. And you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and buy a trader in here to trade with the capital to get the city to accelerate. Um, and then I'll go straight for a campus. So I'll try to accelerate that city a little bit. Go ahead and continue to shoot these knights as they come in. We can basically like three shot knights now. So we're relatively well defended. We're like not worried at all. So I was going to say this would be a really good location for a campus, but the problem is um, the volcano. So I think if I'm going to put a campus in the city, it's going to go here, and then I'll probably put a commercial hub there. That looks like a reasonable choice. I don't see an issue with this. That works for me. So let's go ahead and buy the, the commercial hub tile and place it. Go ahead and send a trade route to Tenochtitlan. Boom. City is going to build that market in nine turns, or seven turns rather, which is really, really great. Let's improve this mine. We'll go ahead and build that right there. And now we have access to banking. So if we don't have anything important to build, we can throw down those banks to improve our economy. Um, and it also, now that we have access to banking, upgrading our investment into some of these city-states is also a viable move because it will mean that we get plus four gold in every city that we build a bank. Because, you know, you, you kind of want to play around these sort of like milestones. I would like to change my government... But I'm going to wait until exploration to do that. Now that I have access to banking, I would like to start thinking about industrialization um, because industrialization will give me plus one production from mines as well as access to the factory building that I was talking about. Um, but I don't have to rush there. I can take my time. I'm trying to think about what my next steps are for advancing my empire. And this is kind of like a part of the tech tree where you can kind of meander around a little bit and it's not too big of a deal. Getting Oxford University might not be a bad move, so I'm going to head towards scientific theory for the prospective Oxford University, as well as the plus one food from plantations. The extra food will increase the tempo of my empire because I have a decent amount of plantations across my empire. Extra food translates into more yields, so it seems like a reasonable thing to do. Um, let's go ahead and place down the commercial hub in this city to make sure we lock in its price, and then we'll get the work of the university. We're getting a huge amount of error score from doing all these things. I don't think I'm ready to do external trade routes, so... But I don't think this city needs a trade route. I'm going to go ahead and put it into this. Like, this city, Sempawala, is, like, really, really well established now. I don't need to use internal trade routes in here. And so that's what you kind of want to do. You want to put an internal trade route into a city until it's self-sustaining. Um, and then once it is, you can kind of be like, okay, this city doesn't need that trade route anymore. I can, like, send it externally or put it in a different city. Um, so that's how you kind of want to be thinking. Like, think of traders as, like, ah... Here's the best way to think of traders. Think of them like workers, like citizens, like population that you can move around your empire. That's like a really good way to think about them. And so are builders. You can, you can move production between cities, essentially. So again, I'm continuing to trade with my capital. And the other nice effect of this is that it actually builds roads between all of my cities. So it allows me to move my units around and defend myself a little bit better. So that there's plenty of reasons to kind of play the way that I'm playing. And hopefully I'm explaining it very, very well. 
I've gone on relatively long now and we've done about 35 turns. So I'm going to call this the end of the episode. We're on track for a pretty good uh, next era. Our empire metrics are really, really nice. Like we have good gold, we have good culture, we have good science. In terms of tempo, we're looking really, really nice. Now we're a little bit behind the AI, but we still have so much room to expand and continue to grow. And our cities haven't even finished like building all their infrastructure. So once we get all this stuff up and running, we're going to be in great shape. Uh, but that's going to be it for me. I love you all very much. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.